Hey guys, Mo Long with Electromaker here. Welcome to Me to Maker episode two. I am really excited to sit down with self-professed maker of things and magical unicorn software engineer, Amy Double D. You can check out her website, amydd.com. You can follow her on Instagram at Amy Double D and on Facebook at Amy Double D, as well as on Twitter at Amy Double D. If you want to follow Electromaker, you can check us out at electromaker.io. You can follow us on Twitter at electromaker.io, on Facebook at electromaker.io, and on Instagram at electromaker underscore io. And if you want to keep up with me, you can follow me at Mitchell C. Long on Twitter and Instagram. Hey Amy, thanks for joining. I'm actually a huge fan of a number of the games that you worked on with Marvel, including Marvel Super Hero Squad, The Infinity Gauntlet. So tell me a little bit about your day job. I worked on um, the first Thor game. I worked on the, um, the physics calculations for the cape. Um, because in computers and stuff like that, stuff that is very computationally expensive to render. Um, I always like it when you say computationally expensive. People are like, what do you mean expensive? Um, so to render that many like polygons for this cape was um, a big challenge. Um, use a lot of like ragdoll physics. Um, I guess one of the first games to do that was like Jurassic Park. But it's pretty much where if you shoot someone or someone falls, they fall in a natural way. And it's not just like, oh. um, yeah, so that's like my actual day job. So I do like a lot of the simulation and the collision detection for not just games. They do a lot of for real world stuff. Like um, we had done one. It was like, oh, if there's a, a zombie outbreak and the outbreak happens here, this is how long it would take to, you know, infect all the people. But in reality, they use that kind of data for um, like, say, a bird had some disease. How long would it take for that bird to travel to the state, this country? And you know, then, what's that movie? Uh, day, I forget what it's called. Anyways, days, not, days later. Yeah, yeah. Then, then that's how that happened. <laughs> Good reference. I love that film. Yeah, I was like, something days. Yeah, so that's what I actually do. <laughs> I think, as far as like the hobby, um, most of like any company I've worked for, it's like anything has to do with IP. So. When I worked at Marvel, like, if you think you're going to have, like, creative freedom, like, no, I'm sorry, the Hulk is green. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're, you're not getting that. And then I worked in a manufacturing for um, the consoles for Xbox, and um, they don't want you sharing their information. So I think the nice thing about, like, at least, like, the 3D printing, the electronics and all of that, I'm like, all right, finally I can, like, talk about something I'm actually working on. Because most of the time, if you're using enterprise software um, and you have an issue with your code, you're not going and posting it on a forum uh, to get help for that kind of stuff, which is would be great if you could. If you just find someone else that kind of has a problem that posted about it. So, uh, yeah, that's where all the rambling came from. <laughs> that's a super cool uh, backstory. And can you talk about your maker origin story? Like, what was your introduction to the makerspace. To the, to the makerspace specifically? Yes. Ah, OK, so I'm part of the Dallas makerspace here. And we're the largest one in the United States. And it blows my mind, because I've been to a few other makerspaces. And ours is very clean and organized. You know, if you have to take um, any of the machines that have to do with like security settings, uh, you have to take safety for this class. It's just an RFID tag. You know, it says it's just access control. but it's so well ran. Um, okay, backing up first, I guess, before I talk about how well it's ran. Backstory is like our, our company was looking to outsource some, um, some parts for manufacturing. Normally they have manufacturing goes through China and to get some of the boards made, whether they're one off or I think we had minimum like a thousand boards at a time for prototypes. It takes a long time. It's expensive. So they were kind of looking at like, hey, where can we go around here that we could like utilize some tools before you know a company like would invest I don't know a quarter of a million dollars on a machine or something and um, 
that place came up in like the research and we didn't the company like that I work for we didn't they didn't join it but I'm like huh that place like sounds super interesting um, so then I used one of our work 3d printers to print a sword like no one noticed like because they pretty much just like line everything up and then the people that run through the machine so if you just put another file in there it's all um, like SL, you know powder print so you would you would never know it's not like it's they're not paying attention and um, I was like holy crap like I guess like additive manufacturing is more than just making like assembly and parts and like consoles and Xbox controllers which is all well and cool but I don't think I ever appreciated it till I realized like oh and yeah now whenever I go like to the dollar store I just think about like you know so I like bought that like lava lamp at the dollar store but I'm like, somebody had to design that. Someone had to do electronics. Somebody had to either make a prototype of it, do some injection molding, then the assembly, then the screws, then get it passed, then get it in the United States. I'm like, and they sell it for a dollar. And so, like, I think about, like, that process way more. And it's just, like I said, that's why sometimes I'll just go to the dollar store and I'll, I don't know, like, take 20 bucks and I'll buy stuff and I'll rip it apart and just super interesting. Because I made this little shield thing, I don't know what it is, for um, for Hackaday, because I was trying to explain my point about, like, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you can take stuff, it's the reverse engineer. Um, but from a manufacturing perspective, this, like, little toy had only five different parts, and it's all gears and just two springs, and I'm like, huh, that's, like, pretty, I need to find it, it's in my rambling of my house somewhere. Guys, <laughs> I swear. Well, let me find it because it's really neat. You'll, you'll appreciate it. Okay, I'm excited. <laughs> so it was just like this little kid's toy, and then I like modified a few pieces to 3D print for the Hackaday thing. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's super like entertaining because it's just it was like a few gears. I don't know. So I pretty much went in and I tried to redesign my own gears for that, and then just made a little standoff and 3D printed this, and it was. It was a good point for what I was trying to talk about. So where did you get the inspiration for your uh, alterations for this specific piece? For the alterations? Um, <laughs> to make it sound not creepy when you go down the kid's aisle? <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to do that stuff when I was a kid, and I know my parents hated it because they're like, we just got you that... Um, I don't know if it comes, it's not from, it's not from boredom. I think it's kind of like an obsessive trait. You're like, I notice I like obsess about little things. If somebody's just sitting there playing with like, um, I forget what they're called. They're the little refill things that people do for the, like the cigarette, uh, the fake cigarettes. Oh, I know what you're talking about. So, um, that little thing has a little inductive like heat coil on it right so i was just sitting there like watching this person and i think you're trying to figure out how stuff works and um to me i'm like where's the battery like that you know this thing is like so tiny and it has this little like refill so in my way i'm like hmm how could i like you know add that or you know use it for a costume or something because that's like what makes costumes fun is it's like some you can geek out with someone about some fandom. That's like, that's what makes costumes fun. Yeah, and uh, I, I really liked, uh, among other things, the Zelda Princess Hilda LED staff. Yeah, that was fun. That was like, that was one of the first things I shared on Arduino too. So that's, it's, it's funny because to me, I feel it's very, very simple. You know, it's just a tiny little microcontroller with some pre-programmed LEDs that are one color, green. And, um, but the thing is, like, everyone that wants to add, like, lights or stuff to their costumes, they're not engineers, but they, they want to know. So if you can, it's like a gateway drug. You can just make one, like, really easy little project, and if they're successful, then then they start to build and add on to that. Um, and that's the thing, like, the fandom for, like, you know, the Zelda franchise is, is really big. I love that. Like, I love those games, obviously. And they, yeah, I think that's probably, like, a good thing. Somebody's like, oh, maybe I could actually do this, and it wouldn't cost me, like, $1,000 to do this. Right. Far, far less expensive than Nintendo-licensed versions. 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. So do you have a favorite Zelda game? I like Ocarina of Time. That's my favorite. Is it? That's funny. Everyone's like, what? I just have very strong memories playing that with like my brothers and, you know, it was, we had it on the 64, so I don't even know how long. But so I have twin brothers, and so we would always just, like, sit and watch each other play or, you know, fight over who can play or, you know, tell each other where you're supposed to go when you get lost in the forest. And, um, yeah, I just have strong, like, memories of that game more than any of the other Zelda games, I guess. Same. When did play it? That was the first one I ever played in full, so I think that's why I appreciate yeah, it so yeah. much. I played some of the other ones, but I just don't. I was, like, right at that age that I just remember so many like stories or, you know, throwing the controllers across the room. Well, they're still attached to the thing, but. <laughs> so. The days before wireless. I know. And so another question that I had was, where do you draw your inspiration from for your projects? <laughs> I guess I always feel I'm very, like, influenced by whatever I'm, like, reading or watching or playing, like, at that moment and because my friend and I we had um we had a discussion she's like all right what's on your like bucket list for like costumes to make and I have like I keep a like a Trello board of all my projects like organized or like wish list ones or if I find research I'll add like screenshots and stuff in there but I'm very much like influenced by whatever I'm reading or playing and I guess that's like based on emotion or you know so when I was playing The Witcher, I was, like, obsessed with that game. So I, like, you know, you're obsessed with everything in that kind of little, like, fantasy LARPing world. Um, playing Assassin's Creed right now. So, like, it's interesting how your, like, mindset switches or you you pay attention to stuff a little bit different. Or, like, reality of, like, how stuff fits. Because for the, the Witcher costume, when I had made this, like, leather corset... It's, like, more than a corset. It, like, comes past your hips a little bit. And she, like, fights in that thing in the game. But when we were at the convention center going, like, to the back to the hotel, I couldn't even, like, sit in that thing. I had to, like, lay down, like, a hot dog in the seats. Because it's not a – I don't know. It's just funny because it's, like, all right, who who made that, knowing that you can't even, like, bend over or move your sword? It's just – I'm sure you play games, so you know, like <laughs> – at this point it's like it's like a challenge like i feel like the like the designers and the modelers do it on purpose they're like let's see who can actually make this and people do and i think you even see that in movies a lot like i feel i feel like i read something about the costumes in wonder woman were actually kind of realistic as opposed to a lot of the other armor that you see with these like ridiculous breastplates that would crack if you hit them once very lightly yeah they're that's actually interesting because sometimes they bring in like um, what does stun people like if you ever watch the Expanse, um, I went to a panel and they had hired these like actual like you know PhDs and scientists to give you know actual information and stuff that could actually happen um, for the show. So I was like, oh, that's pretty interesting. I'm like, I want my anti gravity boots. <laughs> Those are on my bucket list of. I have to get into, like, that NASA place in uh, California like, on my lowly. Gotta, lowly find a way. Got to get some of those. They might be a little difficult to go the DIY route with. I know. And then how would you act on that? was, like, my – there's a, there's a thing. It's, a like, a, this anti-gravity chamber, that's, but it's part of NASA. Um, it's out in the Bay Area. And I only know is because I'm like, oh, maybe it's open to the public. So – um, my brother works for Facebook out there, so when I was out in the Bay, I was like, oh, I'm just going to drive by here. Well, not knowing, as soon as you cross, like, that line, you're actually on government property. So they, like, then took my license and my ID because they wanted to make sure I, like, got off of the property and turned around. I was like, oops. That's a little intense. <laughs> yeah, it was actually more scary because I, I, did, I did kind of think, like, where I was going was public, but it clearly was not. They're on that like that. I'm like, dang. Yeah. So. I'm not surprised. I watched enough X-Files to know. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned, you've mentioned fandoms a few times. Can you talk a little bit about the overlap between the makerspace and cosplay? Ooh, yeah. 
I feel that's definitely like, I feel that's probably been a big part of like some of the success for a lot of these, these maker spaces because, you know, say somebody wants to come in and they want to sew something. We have this entire thing in our Dallas maker space. We call it men that sew because it used to be that like the sewing, you know, the women were separated and it wasn't considered a maker thing. Um, but we have like industrial sewing machines for like leather. So then they were teaching classes. It's like, hey, you can use the laser cutter to cut out this pattern. Then you could go in and sew like a piece for like a knife or, you know, some type of something that they thought was manly or something like that. But it's, it's like you learn one thing and then you're like, oh, hey, there's all these other tools or something that's available. Because you, you don't have to spend a lot of money. And I think that's probably... I'm trying to think what I am. Um, so we have a metal forge too, right? And I obviously would not buy like an entire, or I wouldn't go to the process of like setting that up anytime I wanted to use the forge. So I think a lot of it has to do with availability and the community. Like the community is really good. I find you go up there, you don't know what you're doing. People give you suggestions or feedbacks or input or actually will show you how to use a machine. Um, yeah, that community is... Because here's the thing, like, if you, since I normally go to, like, software developer conferences, everyone's in normal clothes, right? <laughs> so, um, I, and I tell this story all the time, but it, I don't know, it's the perfect way to describe it. So, you go to a software developer conference, we're all standing around, why would I ever approach you and talk to you if you're in normal clothes and I know nothing about you, nothing about what you do, except to make it some weird, awkward thing and say, hi, like, you know, it's, but the thing about dressing in costume is, you have so many reasons to just go talk to that person. You're like, hey, I like this fandom. I want a picture of that. I want to know how you made it. I just want to admire it. Like, you get out of your comfort zone and you just talk to strangers. I've met so many amazing people because of just that. Or you just, like, you end up going back and asking, like, hey, where did you end up hiring, hiding the wires for the battery? And then they, like, send you a picture and the next thing you know it looks like terrible on the inside and you're like oh that makes me feel good because my stuff looks like spaghetti too <laughs> and um it, it it gets away from like that that stereotype that everything has to be perfect um because a lot of the times like you're talking about like the picture you have a really good picture of your costume but you don't see like the the process that goes into it you don't see the the inside shell of like, like you know the, the chaos and I think that's like it doesn't have to be perfect I don't know just finish something that's probably like a good a good accomplishment of woohoo absolutely uh and kind of dovetailing off of that what's a recent challenge that you've encountered during a project and how did you end up overcoming that hmm, I haven't overcome it yet <laughs> Ooh, even better. <laughs> um, I've been trying to do some stuff with some animatronics, um, which is just moving, you know, I actually did a, this, conveniently there was a workshop at Hackaday to make this ridiculous tentacle thing. <laughs> like, I'm sure there's like a million inappropriate comments, but it's so mesmerizing. You know, I'm going to show you because it's like... <laughs> but, I know. It's super silly and like when you like, all right, don't laugh, but I have to show you something. That's what that's why I was like telling my dad. I'm like, right, don't judge this video I'm about to send you. Just <laughs> but it's got four strings on it, so it just like but it moves really natural, so it's super fluid, but the problem I'm having is like this is really heavy, and if I want to try to put, like, eight or ten of those in a costume, and I want to have it with, like, a servo motor, I feel the, the predicament is always, like, where do you put the battery? And where do you hide everything? And that's heavy, and stuff breaks, and... Yeah, that's, like, my, my predicament right now. Because it's kind of interesting, because, like, the way that these... They're just string. It's actually, like, fishing lure string. It's not anything fancy. It just supports like a 200-pound fish or something. Um, really that. And I mean, you could probably 3D print some of these, which I probably will. But I think what the weight is what gives it that like 
that flow. Yeah, that's a that's going to be an interesting challenge. That's pretty ingenious, and it it does seem very fluid. Like when you were kind of demonstrating its movement. Yeah, it's like, and I was like, why is it so therapeutic? To like to watch, and I think it's because, like we we like as humans, we don't we don't move like that. So that's what kind of like makes it weirdly mesmerizing, I guess. So, I'll be interested yeah. to see how that project progresses. Yeah, that will be. I guess my other like main project that's not costume related is I've been working. Um, I don't know like how much you've seen of my rambling stuff, but um, I have a like an an implant in my hand, a chip implant, just a transponder one. And I just recently finally got my Tesla Model Three, so I've been working to use the chip implant in my hand to start my car. And um, I just actually released that stuff like a few days ago. I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to release it because it's me talking to myself in there. <laughs> like embarrassing. But um, I had a few friends who were like, just do it. And um, so I did. So far, like, not, I only had like one person like say, like, call me like anti-Satan devil people. So What? Yeah, because like the, the chip stuff is like the, the mark of the beast, the 666. I've never heard of yeah that's kind of yeah. awesome though <laughs> um somebody like gave me a shirt it said three 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 only half evil i'm like that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's clever i like it yeah. i see the but it, it, it's that's been like a really interesting like little um side journey besides like the implant itself but um i dropped my phone like in the acetone jar and who knew <laughs> Yeah, but it dissolved. Like, my phone's okay. So, I don't know how. Somehow it survived. But, yeah, I ended up, like, going to the the test. Because they give you a valet card. And the valet card is pretty much the same as, like, a hotel key. It's got a little tiny, you know, transponder chip in it. And um, I cut the first one the first time I did it. I'm like, what are the odds? The thing is, like, millimeters. And I cut, like, the one place it is. Um, and I dissolved a few of the other ones in acetone. Uh, but then I had trouble reading it after, so, yeah, it's going to work. We'll just have to get there. Yeah. I'll join the Tesla body hacking division. <laughs> it seems like uh, it seems like it's a complex project, too. I don't feel it's, like, as complex. So I originally, do you ever play the Lego Dimension games? I don't think I did. So... I have some because I was actually, this is part of my test. So they're, I can actually, so they're like on the Xbox and the PlayStation, but um, they it comes with like a toy pad that plugs into the console. And the way it pretty much works is each one of these has like a tiny little, you know, RFID tag. So when you put it on the game pad, the little character actually pops up in the game. So I thought like this would be like a good test kind of where I was waiting for my Tesla. I'm like, oh, I'll be sneaky because you can buy these tags for like a dollar at like a used Lego store and I was like I'll just read the data off this write it to my chip and then I could put my hand on the gamepad so then the like character would pop up and I can be like I'm Batman <laughs> would be but there must be some type there is like a unique ID on this chip and you know it's not as easy as just like scanning this data and writing it to an own tag which seems logical because they're trying to sell these for the game um but if not like what would be the point but yeah so like that's kind of like where this like little like it started from these little lego dimension characters that's such a neat evolution it's a, such a thing <laughs> because i always i always i don't know lego has always been like a weird thing to like explain stuff so if it works it'll be like a, a good origin story i guess absolutely and I liked the Lego interactive wall project as well that you did. But do you have a favorite project that you've completed? Hmm. hmm. Is that like picking a favorite child? <laughs> I don't know, because I feel that I've learned, you learn lots of things from projects, but... Hmm. And also it's like funny because time influences that. It's like obviously whatever you just worked on, that bird, like, you know, it's like the shared trauma of like... <laughs> finish something before that last like event so I did something that's like I guess like a 
touchy feeling like feeling. Um, I have a friend who is, um, she's also a software developer. She was like one of my only friends that was another girl software developer, which is still a very rare thing. Um, she actually moved. She's in Seattle now. She took a job. She works for, um, for Amazon on the Alexa team. And uh, so when we went to Dragon Con, she's like, all right, we're going to do Disney princesses this year. And I'm like, no, that's like against my morals. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing that. Um, she's like, no, no, we'll make them like the self rescuing kind and we'll do like armor and stuff. So, you know, obviously we weren't together, but we would have Google hangouts when we were like working on our stuff. And it's such a like positive experience to like, instead of making it a competition, you're like sharing what you worked on and like how to make each other better. Um, because I think that sometimes people don't, they either don't share because they think they have, like, you know, their, their secret that no one knows about, or two, they think it sucks. I think, I find that's probably, or you don't have time, that's probably the majority of why people don't share stuff. And I, I don't know, it was funny because we were talking, and I said something, I was like, oh, I wish I would have, you know, we would have had someone help with this, like, concept for, like, an idea. And she's like, oh, actually, I was just looking at that. I'm like, why don't we just both talk mm-hmm. about that? Um, yeah, but that, like, you know, that collaboration and just with somebody that you already have, like, a, you know, a connection with. And that project was the first time I, like, because I 3D printed some stuff um, on fabric for the breastplate. And that, like, so I didn't know what I was going to do for that. So she was like, why don't you just do that? And we were just talking. And I was like, mm, that might work. So, yeah, I guess, like, that's I also really like the Rufio because that was like Rufio. <laughs> Did you ever see the Hook movies with Robin Williams, the Peter Pan movie? Hook? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did. That's a great movie. It was a 90s, like 90s movie because it was. So I did Rufio, which is the one with the red hair and the bamboo and all the bones. It was funny. I was like, oh, this will be my casual one. <laughs> there were like 74 like bones on this thing. And I'm like, oh, I'll 3D print. And then I'm over here, like, standing, hating my life. So I ended up just making, like, molds and, like, just, like, cast them. But it was fun because you could tell everyone that was kind of, like, you know, in my or your age group because they were, like, Rufio. And then, like, all the little kids were, like, what's that? Because they didn't know the character. Oh, no. But it's, like, you could tell, like, it's, like, that nostalgic, like, definitely 90s uh, character. I need to rewatch that because I think the last time I watched it was like on VHS in the nineties. Oh, yeah, it's it's an old, but I I love I don't know. It was funny. I just it probably was on TV and came up, and I was like, I'm like that would be a really fun character to do. Of course, like the quality is like terrible. You know, trying to go back through and like look at the scene, <laughs> trying to like, count the bones and but and it's like four eighty i. Terrible resolution, trying to count all the bones. Uh, but I, I so like since you guys deal with like everything is like electronics projects, right, or yeah. some coding, which is super neat because um, I've been doing some stuff to make my own PCBs. Like uh, wow. that, that's like the next gateway drug. I feel after right, it's like the last. It's like when you almost like leveled up to the. Um, and I've had like really good, you know, friends in the community that helped me out that actually do that full time and um we were trying to figure out a way to do um like a tiny tiny little leds like almost like an android thing and embed it in a uh like a silicone for like a prosthetic so um i've been working like on that kind of stuff too and what makes that hard is like how do you you know if you're gonna send that off to get you know manufactured not manufactured but like you know order a few boards it still takes five to six days and that's like a rapid one to get it so that makes it hard if you're like hey I can't uh, test this um I'm always looking for for stuff like that I'm glad you mentioned that because I was curious what is some technology that you haven't been able to get hands on with that you'd like to Hmm. Technology? Oh, that's like a that's something I don't have access to. 
technology. And then you can like, you can answer this one in the meantime if you're thinking. But what is your favorite piece of technology to work with? Because you've worked with a lot of stuff from Arduino to NeoPixel and Bear Conductive, which I ha actually hadn't heard of uh, that paint pen. I was like, that's super cool. Yeah, it's a it's a conductive paint. Um, they're really okay. That it's actually pretty interesting because you know it's water soluble and it's supposed to be like safe and stuff. But obviously. Um, it doesn't, the current is not as good uh, as, a, you know, a piece of wire. So when I had made, like, something, obviously the further the distance for, um, you know, where your LED or your power source is, that current, you know, is weaker the farther you get down. So that's, like, a, a fun learning curve. But you don't have to do any soldering with that, which makes that a really good, like, intro, especially for, like, new people that are trying to do stuff for costumes or pieces. I don't know. So we do have like a, a Haas, which is um, for our CNC, for our, our metal. Um, I Like designing those files, you can still use like a, your CAD programs like Fusion 360, which makes it nice. You don't have to learn another piece of software. But it's the opposite of thinking um, when doing like 3D printing, because 3D printing is creating from, from nothing, right? Whereas you know, using the, the CNC, you literally have your, your block of metal or your wood or your plastic, whatever you're doing, and then you're taking away. So I had made like one of the little safety classes to go through is to make this little domino piece to cut on this uh, on the Haas for the, the CNC. And I was super like I was adding like fillets and all this stuff like you do in 3D printing. And then you get the thing back and it tells you, hey, if you were going to, you know, manufacture, this is how much it would cost and this is how long it's going to take. And I'm like, oh, my God, why is it so expensive? But it's because I was adding all of these, like, fancy designs and that's not, like, that's not the process that it works. So I'm like, hmm, yeah, that's something, like, that's hard to get away, like, to think about that. What else do I, that I don't really use? I don't use the wood shop as much as, like, I probably should. I'm trying to think. I don't know. What other software? I don't know. I feel like everything so much is open source, too. It's... Oh, yeah. Mm, we don't have anywhere kind of, like, technical, but um, to do, like, painting, like, airbrush painting. And I think that's probably because, like, an auto body shop, you need, like, filtration and all of that kind of stuff. Um, we do have some stuff in the electronics room, like, uh, microscopes and stuff. And I don't, I'm like, I don't know. Like, I would never have a project to use that for. I say that now, but. Um, <laughs> you got to come up with one. I know. It, but it's also sometimes I'm like, I don't understand the purpose of that machine. Like, what what would you use that for? Because it's. An expensive machine. Um, that, hmm. That's a great point, though, about things like uh, airbrushing and even woodworking and soldering. Like you have to have a space and ventilation. So yeah. I end up not could, using a, a lot of that stuff. Yes, yeah, <laughs> the woodshop has all the ventilation and the stuff for like the the saw chips and all that. And you know they obviously you know dump it out. The fire and safety team comes, but the painting is still very different for like the fumes for that. Um, yeah, that'll be because we actually just bought the space next to us. So that'll be really interesting to see, you know, if they'll actually add one. Yeah, I don't know what they, my friend, I did just go to my friend's shop out uh, when I was in California and they have a really neat photogrammetry booth, which I, I think I would probably like that. So, you know, they they have like a hundred cameras, so you stand in it, it takes 360 pictures of you, so you can render, um, you know, like a, a 360 model really well, which is funny because I told them, I was like, oh, when we were in college, we rented a, a racquetball uh, court at the, like at the gym, because that was one of the only rooms that was like unobstructive, and it was like a perfect, you know, um, rectangle, and we just used like Xbox Connect um, <laughs> cameras to... And I'm like, oh, it sounds super ghetto now, but we were so impressed with ourselves when we did that. And, you know, and then you go in this, like, and you have this 360 booth, and it's like, oh. but he said there's still, like, there's still a lot of post cleanup when you do 
these photogrammetry like kind of uh photos so or models i guess what they would be now what was the other question uh, <laughs> to... i think you i think you answered both yeah i don't know about like tools and software everything so much like is i guess i'm very fortunate like stuff is available that i you know our makerspace has it and if it weren't for the makerspace I would never, you know, be able to use some of these like awesome tools. And I don't know, that's what I'm trying to think what we do have that we have everything. Like we don't have cooking. I take that back. That could be like a I don't know. And that totally is cooking is definitely in the makerspace. I just don't think it gets recognized as such. Very and it's often. also a big like a big kitchen could be really expensive yeah especially if you get nice equipment uh, I, I do like the you know like a lot of the molding and the casting that's like as far as prosthetics i have this like a head cast i had done it myself so if i'm trying to do like prosthetic ears or something it's easier to work on looks like like one of the heads from westworld so it's <laughs> People are like, is that your face? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> but it's like creepily in the corner in this room. So, um, because like, if you always think about like, you know, there's stuff that you can learn. It's like always the basic you could YouTube of, you know, how to use this uh, table saw to cut a straight line. All right. that That's like, that's level zero. And, but by the time you want to get and do stuff, that's like a little more advanced, like, where where do you go from there or you need an expensive tool just to do one thing and i think that's what makes like you know the maker space or if there you feel there's a need for it and you don't have that tool you can sometimes pitch to that committee or that department and i don't know they'll buy them sometimes yeah <laughs> maker spaces are beautiful in the way that they've made a lot of these the tools more accessible for the average person yeah, plus a lot of people will donate too. Like if they, you know, they had a shop and then they're like, hey, we're not, we're retiring, but there's still these machines, you know, somebody's got to maintain them. Um, yeah. It's a lovely community outlet. Yeah. So what advice would you give to someone who is just starting out in the makerspace? Hmm. Besides taking the safety classes? <laughs> That's valuable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's some that are required. You have to take the safety classes. Um, I think to use, like, sometimes people go in, they, like, have set really, really big projects. Um, I, think, I find it's really, it's better to, you know, set a small task for yourself and then understand, like, so, for example, I was trying to make this, um, I had, like, a piece of leather and I was trying to, raster um or engrave uh the marauder's map from harry potter and then i was going to turn it oh. and then i was going to make it into a, like a corset oh yeah <laughs> it, like kind of a big project in itself and i'm like i probably should have just started with like being able to raster on this like piece of leather so not only were like the software tools like different than what i was used to but i had to get used to like the the settings for the laser and the power and the problem is like you mess up and then that's like your piece of leather. It's not like, whoops. Then after all of that, I realized, oh, well now I'm going to have to cut a piece to attach and sew. So now my pattern on my maps don't line up. I was like, uh, why don't you start with something small? So it, it's funny, like all these other like situations or problems will arise and they can kind of be discouraging. So I always feel if I can like set like a, a win for myself, like, then it's like, okay, I understand how that works. I understand why that works that way. And then you can, you know, make it more complicated after. And I find people are always working on stuff too. And you can just ask, be like, hey, what are you working on? And they'll, they'll tell you, like, our community is, you know, it's 24-7, 365. So there's always somebody making or blowing something up and in the best way possible. <laughs> Absolutely. And kind of to circle back to what you were saying earlier, it's, it's a lot different than an enterprise environment where there's a lot more like secrecy. and Yeah, like this is definitely like a, 
the sharing sharing community because I hate to compare it but like I find that like people say it's like what makes like religion so successful because people are looking for you know something or some you know people to connect to or you have something else in common with them and it's like not a religion in a way but it's it's a community it's something that <sighs> so like I'm sure your parents probably told you when you were a kid they're like don't um don't talk to strangers don't get in the car with strangers and then like today it's literally like <laughs> call a stranger to pick me up in my uber car to meet my friends from the internet <laughs> and so but I, it's weird because I find like I have I have friends that I grew up with that I absolutely love but like we were all like at a dinner and like some of the like they were talking about like a purse or something so to me I'm not like really interested in that like you know I love my friends I grew up with them and stuff but it's like I feel like I have to fake this conversation and What's strange about, like, you know, your Twitter friends or your internet friends, like, you have something in common with them. Um, like, it's the community. It's like, hey, this person is interested in, you know, cosplay, 3D printing. You have all these reasons to, like, geek out with them about something. And the internet. You're never weird on the internet. <laughs> that's, well, that's a good life. I think I'm always weird, but... <laughs> Yeah, but the, That's, but the I'm internet, okay with that. <laughs> the internet, you find other people that are like you, so it's like you're like, oh, I'm not as like weird as I thought. Because exactly. I was homeschooled too, so that was like, I used to work with these people, and then we we're talking, and I'm like, oh yeah, and I was homeschooled, and they were like, oh, that explains it. I'm like, it explains what? So, I thought that was like humorous, and then I'm like, oh, I guess homeschool kids were like the weird kids. So. I don't think that's true. Hey guys, thanks for listening. This was Me to Maker episode two featuring Amy Double D. Once again, you can check her website out at amydd.com. You can follow her on Instagram, Amy Double D, on Facebook, Amy Double D, and on Twitter, at Amy Double D. If you want to follow Electromaker, you can follow us on the internet at electromaker.io. You can follow us on Twitter at electromaker.io, on Instagram, electromaker underscore io, and on Facebook at electromaker.io. If you want to follow me, you can check me out at Mitchell C. Long on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks for listening, and let me know what makers you want me to feature on the podcast.